synopsis uh, before I got married. So, <laughs> so life has changed a little and I need to introduce my wife, uh, Jenny Lorena Alomia. Uh, so, she's been with me as long as I've been in Des Moines. Uh, I moved her here uh, from Columbia, South America about five months ago and we were in South Carolina for two months. She said, no, this is okay, this is okay. And I moved it to the morning and said, whoa, 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 hey, hey, I didn't sign up for this. So, uh, so we're going through some problems right now. Please pray. No, just, <laughs> but um, first off, th thank you once again for allowing me to be here. Uh, President Henning, uh, Pastor Russ, Trey, uh, special thank you to Alex Piedras for inviting me. Uh, I want to say thank you to Dr. Baba um, for just... Grandview has been great so far. First time I came here was, uh, I, I believe it was the Latino Forum. They, they invited the Latino Forum group to come out. And I got to watch a few people yell at other people. But, um, <laughs> but um, I'm really glad to be here. I'm really glad to be here. And I'll be honest, being here, I, I feel like I've kind of come full circle. Because I remember this day in the 80s and the 90s, this was a big day for us when I was a kid. You know, King Day had officially been signed into, signed into law in 1983 by Ronald Reagan. And so every time after that, I was a kid, you know, when you're a kid and you, got, you don't have to go to school, you just want to eat cereal, pancakes, and stay at home. But now, get up, get up, why, why? And we go to these King speeches and watch people cross arms and sing, we shall overcome. I'm, I'm the best, that should have been on the program, Alex. But, um, and it was just something that I eventually got to look forward to as I got older. And it was something that I loved and something that I appreciated. And now, I'm giving the speech. So, um, it's a different feeling. I kind of feel like I, I've come full circle. If I had to come out to a theme song today, it would have been started from the bottom. Now we, you know, if I was a Toronto rap, uh, Toronto rapper, uh, rapper. But um, but that's that's okay. Um, when Mr. Pierre just called me and asked me to do it, I said yes before he could actually even say what it was. Hey, we're doing it. Yes, <laughs> because I, this day is very. This means a lot to me, and and because it was Grandview University, one thing I love to do is I love speaking to the next generation. That's something I love to do. Um, as they said in my bio, I, am, I was a professor. I've, I've, I've taught people from 2011 up until uh, 2015. I also was an adjunct when I came back to the United States. And one thing I like to do is impact the next movers and shakers, the people who will come after me. I mean, I'm still a little young, so I don't, I mean, that I still, I just took this photo, you see, I took that on my birthday, December 14, 2015. I, I'm still a little young, so, so I, maybe I'm still a mover and shaker, but I love to speak to the movers and shakers. Because um, you are the ones, the youth, who will impact Des Moines, Iowa, and the rest of the country. You know, my position, my role in Des Moines is credited to the Civil Rights Movement. I wouldn't even be standing before you. I wouldn't even have a job in the city of Des Moines if it wasn't for uh, the people who came before me, the forerunners. People like Martin Luther King and other civil rights leaders fought for equal opportunity. And as the director of civil and human rights for the city of Des Moines, my goal is to advance justice and equality by preventing and eliminating discrimination in the city of Des Moines. And we do that through investigations. We do that through mediation. We do that to, through testing in order to make sure that everybody has the opportunity 
to rise up the social mobility ladder, that there are no barriers that stand in your way. Now, just because my position and place in society was built off the backs of my forerunners, doesn't mean I'm gonna give you a feel good speech. Um, as a former college professor, it is my job to expand your horizons and challenge you. And it is also your job to challenge you. That is my goal today, to challenge each and every one of you. I'm gonna stir that pot a little that's called your mind, just to help you to wake up a little more and see what's happening in the world around you. So, this won't be a feel-good speech telling you how far you've come. Uh, so, so many times nowadays, the this, this speech is always, hey, we, we did it, we did it. And, but as President Henning mentioned, there's still a lot of frustration, there's still a lot of anger, there's still a lot of issues that haven't, haven't been tapped yet or haven't been fully addressed. So I'm here today to tell you about how far we still have to go. And one of the best ways to do that, one of the best ways to stir the pot and expound your mind about the life of Martin Luther King. Martin Luther King Jr., the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., is one of the most popular figures in American history. And without a doubt, the most popular figure in the Civil Rights Movement. Martin Luther King is so popular, he has a day in January and a month in February. Because do they really teach the kids anything else? I mean, every, about every February I go, I get invited to go speak to the kids. And I walk into the classroom, elementary, middle school, doesn't matter. And I say, hey, can anybody name somebody from the Civil Rights Movement? Everybody. Other than Martin Luther King and Rosa Parks. <laughs> what are we teaching the kids? Because there are many persons that played a role in the Civil Rights Movement. I can name a few. Um, Medgar Evers, Andrew Young, Fannie Lou Hyman, Stokely Carmine, John Lewis, C.T. Bibby, Ralph Abernathy, and I could keep going. I could stay up here all day just reciting people that played a role in the Civil Rights Movement. But all we seem to focus on is King, and yet include Rosa because he really got started from the bus boycott which Rosa was in. That's all people seem to know. King has been lifted so high that others have been forgotten. Now, I'm not bashing King. That, that, that's not King's fault. It's not his fault at all. King knows that he started the Southern Christian Leadership Conference with other prominent reverends, Bayard Rustin and other people, strategist Jesse Jackson, to help him address issues happening in the South and other parts of the United States. So many times today, our trailblazers are either lifted to the highest of highs or reduced to the lowest of lows by mainstream America. There is really no middle ground anymore. There's no honest analysis. Either you're a villain or you're a, or, or a hero. That's what they say in The Dark Knight. Either you live long enough to die a hero or be a villain. I think that's how they said it. So either you are whitewashed or blackwashed in today's society. You know, for example, who said this? I am not, nor have I ever been in favor of bringing about in any way the social and political equality of black and white races. Anybody want to take a stab at who said this? Abraham Lincoln. What? What? He said that? No, he said that in 1851 during the Lincoln-Douglas debates when he was trying to get the senator position for Illinois. But people are, hey, he freed the slaves. But there was more to it. And you have to understand full history. Now, who said this? The young generation of whites, blacks, browns, you are living at a time of extremism, a time of revolution when there's got to be change. P 
People in power have misused it, and now there has to be change. And I, for one, will join with anyone, don't care what color you are, as long as you want to change this miserable condition that exists on this earth. Anybody want to take a stab at who said that? Too, too far. All right. Malcolm X. Malcolm X said, I'll be willing to work with anyone, no matter what color you are, as long as you want to change the miserable conditions of this journey. Wait, wasn't he a, 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 a race hater? He was an extremist. He was a segregationist. Malcolm X, through the course of his life, changed his perspective. But if you only take what they give you and don't try to expand your own knowledge, transform your mind, you'll never know that. You'll, you'll never know. Now, I'll give you one more. Eric, we, we zero for zero. All right. We playing basketball, free throws, you wouldn't make the team. All right, one more. It is better for us, both black and white, to be separated. <laughs> Good guess. Good guess. All right. <laughs> but that's the wrong answer. Anybody else want to take, take a stab at it? Guess what? It's Abraham Lincoln again. He said this in 1863, right before the Emancipation Proclamation. So, all human beings. Now, this isn't a put down President Lincoln. I, 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 thank, thank you, President Lincoln, just in case I forgot. All right. But, and this isn't to exalt Malcolm X, but this is just to say that we are all complex individuals. If you told the story, if, I promise you, if you go talk to one of my friends about me that isn't like one of my best friends, one somebody who knew me from when I was in college, Joshua is the director of civil and human rights. That's weird. He was the director of party of when I was in college. So, talk to somebody in law school, they would probably say something like, what, that guy? I'm so awkward. <laughs> but we're all complex individuals, and you shouldn't try to put an individual in a box. Lincoln, considered to be the greatest president amongst many people, had thoughts that are not widely publicized. Malcolm X, who was categorized as an extremist, a race baiter, the hate that produced hate, spent the last 11 months of his life rethinking and reevaluating his views and came to the realization that all men were his brothers and that hatred was not innate but learned. Be careful of what they teach you. Be careful of what they teach you. Make sure that you are trying to expound on the things that you are taught in class. Make sure that you challenge what's being fed to you on a daily basis, whether it be on television, whether it be on the internet, whether it be in the classroom. That's one of the jobs of college, to expand your thinking. A lot of people just go to class, memorize, and then come home and say, I got to be blessed. I'm right. Beating the system. All right, so Christopher Columbus, once upon a time, was looked at as a hero. In 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. We had to memorize that. I didn't, I don't know the rest of it, but I, I think I got to see. All right. But now, he and his brothers, uh, Bartholomew and the rest, they got, their, their, their history's kind of changed. They're now regarded as somewhat murderers and people who started slave trade, modern capitalism. All around the world, it feels like people are slowly, slowly waking up and recognizing that there's more than what a class is telling me. I, mean, I got to do more. There's something going on. The Occupy Movement, Black Lives Matter, and other grassroots organizations by young people around the United States are signs that people are trying to look at the world without rose-colored glasses. They have realized that the American dream that was sold to them didn't come as advertised, and now they are crying out. The dream to them has transformed into a nightmare. We're good examples of that. I'm a millennial. I think I, I'm a millennial. Some, I get, they get confused. Sometimes it's like 
82 to 2000, then it's 81 to 2000. I was born in December of 80. I don't, I don't fit. I'm, I'm aware. But if you look at the reports, this came out from the New York Times just uh, a week ago. It was talking about uh, the gains at the top. Only people who at the top percentile, the top 10%, saw their incomes rise over the last two years. Only the top 10%. Everybody else was in the negative. Everybody else was in the negative. Wages are falling despite our generation being more educated. We're making less money than our parents. We're the first generation that is guaranteed to earn less of an income than our parents. We're earning between five and 9% less than our parents' generation. Something's happening. What's happening to the American dream? But King, he also saw his dream. The speech he gave in March of 1963 turned into a nightmare. King, most famously known for the Montgomery bus boycotts, and the I Have a Dream speech of 1963, lived for another five years after he told the world of his dream. The last five years of his life, 1966 to April of 1968 to be particular, King saw a shift away from his philosophy of nonviolence to one of self-defense and black power. The people were tired of holding back. The same people that marched with King in Birmingham, Montgomery, and Selma had now turned their backs to his teaching, but they never talk about that. Now, King also did himself no favor by speaking out against the Vietnam War. On April 4th, 1967, King gave a speech firmly stating his anti-war stance. He gave the speech exactly one year before he died, April 4th, 1968. His belief caused many people to turn, turn against him. He was disinvited from the White House. Lyndon Baines Johnson closed his door to him. He was one of his closest allies prior to that speech. His organization, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, lost funding from philanthropists and other organizations from around the country, something from which the organization never recovered. The NAACP shunned him, and many persons thought it was a mistake to merge civil rights and the Vietnam War together. Because he spoke out, J. Edgar Hoover and COINTELPRO tried to label him as a communist, which was yesterday's Muslim or anti-American. King was at a particular place in history towards the end of his life. The black people he fought so hard for were now telling him he was outdated, old news, too soft, that he wasn't about this life. For now, nonviolence was too conservative. For the first time in years, King was no longer listed in 1967 as one of the most admired Americans. Four years, after the delivery of the I Have a Dream speech, the Negro was still not free. King's dream was becoming a nightmare. Like King, we are also at a peculiar place in history. Technology has made it easier for us to communicate, yet we are more distant than ever. More access to knowledge through the advent of the so-called information superhighway Yet, we know less history, and children continue to struggle in school. People are more educated, but now we're living check to check. The dream you sold me turned out to be nothing but a farce. So what do you do when, like Dr. King, you found out that the dream that you had has become a nightmare? What do you do when you find that the path that, yourself, that, that you find yourself on seems to lead to an undesirable destination. When people ridicule you for your beliefs, when so-called friends turn against you, like Dr. King, you have to go beyond the dream. 
Go within yourself. Wake up and live. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind and your spirit and your heart. Most people forget or don't know about the five years between King's March on Washington's Four Jobs and Freedom. That is the official name, March on Washington, Four Jobs and Freedom. Most people don't know that the speech is actually 17 minutes long and doesn't start out with saying, I have a dream. He doesn't start that out. Typically, if he would start out, he'd be like, what? Yeah, what? Come slow down. So, but he starts out instead talking about the 100 years between the Emancipation Proclamation and the march and how, it, how they had come to cash a check. The promise guaranteed to them under the 13th, 14th, 15th, Amendments of the Constitution. King scored some of his greatest victories the two years following the March on Washington for Job and Freedom. He played a significant role in the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965. However, even with the passage of those laws, blacks across the South and other parts of the US failed to see any significant change in their circumstances with the passage of those new laws. Because there was no significant change, people began to get restless and wanted to do more than just march. Riots in Watts and other places made King realize that he had to change his tactics. King shifted this shift, and you know what he did? He said, hey, I'm going to Jamaica. He went to Jamaica and took a vacation. And he wrote the book called, Where Do We Go From Here? To Chaos or Community. Now, I'm gonna digress for just a moment. <laughs> Let me say this before I go any further. King's dream in the 1963 speech, he never said, I have a dream that one day we will have a black president in the office. I didn't hear that. I went back and read it. I said, I thought, I, no, he didn't say it. All right. So, but when Obama became president, this, this became the norm, especially if you were a black person. He got these emails every day. Like, hey, dream fulfilled. Like, really? I don't have no job. <laughs> so, <laughs> so no. All the, one person get the job, we had dream fulfilled. I can't read that. I mean, there were a lot of things saying, dream fulfilled, dream fulfilled. Got it every day. Some people even said, now that Obama's president, nobody else will be hungry, all kids will be educated. I was like, do you really understand the powers of the legislative branches? I was like, <laughs> understand. <laughs> Congress got the money, guys. So, uh, the election of Barack Hussein Obama, our president, was not the fulfillment of the dream. It was a great accomplishment, but it was not the fulfillment of Dr. King's dream. A lady came to me, and the only reason I'm really talking about this is because I, I, I go to a lot of events in, in Iowa, uh, in Des Moines, and a lady, she came up to me, and, and she was like, hey, I, I like what you had to say in that meeting we just had. Where are you from? I'm from South Carolina. And you're the director of so, Silver? Yes, yes, I am. Well, I'm so glad to be from the state of Iowa where we fulfilled Dr. King's dream by getting Barack Obama in office. And she didn't know I was working on the speech. I said, no, thank you. Thank you, for the, thank you for the content. I said, thank you. <laughs> so, nowhere did it say anything about a black president. He said he wanted people judged by the content of their character not the color of their skin. But I don't think Congress, the Tea Party, and my congressman, Joe Wilson, AKA Mr. You Lie, got that memo. So, now I'm going back to what I said. All right, so the speech is 17 minutes long. And he says, we've come to cast a trick. Now, when he went to Jamaica, he came back with more clarity and direction. <laughs> and I, I'm a testament to that. The funny thing about traveling is that it does broaden your horizon. When you really travel, not when you spend your time in a resort. And I meet people, hey, I, I, I went to Jamaica. Did you go to the real Jamaica or resort? I'm ocean to the resort. No, you need to go back. So um, <laughs> traveling, getting to know people, getting to meet people where they are gives you clarity. And sometimes your moment of clarity doesn't sit well with everyone. 
I traveled to Colombia in 2010, and by the time I came back two years later, my family and friends, they could barely recognize me. And it wasn't because I lost 30 pounds because I, I gave up the processed food. It was because my, mentally I had changed. My mom looked at me and said, are you my son? She said that a few times. I mean, she said it before, but she said it more after. So, uh, <laughs> but the clarity I received from my life there was priceless. And you can't put a price on mental clarity or peace of mind. King did the same thing. He dug deeper into his beliefs to determine where should we head as a nation. King realized that there were three problems affecting America, which he labeled the three evils of society. He called them racism, mater um, mater uh, ma militarism, and excessive materialism. These three, a these three evils that he called created the economic catastrophe known as property. When you try to keep one person down, when you invest in killing rather than invest in lifting people up, when you invest in trying to acquire more than the other person but off the backs of others, that causes property, according to Dr. King. King recognized that there was going to be any substantive change beyond his initial dream of integration. He called and, and, and called for a radical redistribution of wealth where all people in the richest nation on earth should have everything they need and shouldn't have to live on the bare minimum or scrape to get by which some people now know is the fight for 15. King and the Southern Christian Leadership Conference designed a plan for a new march on Washington. And this time it wasn't about race. This time instead, they weren't just gonna come in one day and leave the next. Because that's what they did with the march on Washington. Washington was one day. This time instead, he called on a day where people they were the organized civil disobedience, a step above nonviolence resistance, where you were deliberately breaking the laws to bring attention to a situation without violence. King believed that until substantive changes were gained, non, that he, he believed that civil disobedience was necessary until substantive changes were gained. He also believed that Nonviolence resistance was necessary because things had changed since the Montgomery bus boycotts. He believed that you had to go beyond nonviolence resistance. You had to now practice organized civil disobedience. Because, once again, things had changed. Now, if you lived in the South in the 1950s and you were a person of Caucasian descent, and all of a sudden, you saw a group of uh, persons of African descent walking the streets singing, we shall overcome. You think the world, oh no, the world's coming to an end. We got to do something about this. So just marching in the streets in the South, nonviolence resistance, was considered a rebellion. It was a rebellious act. But once again, once the 1964 Civil Rights Act passed and the 1965 Voting Rights Act passed, things kind of changed, especially in the North. You couldn't really do a march in the north in a city where, because the city was uh, north was more industrial, more more urban, because that was just considered a daily thing. Hey, somebody, hey, another person protesting. <laughs> Good luck, guys. Get out of the way. <laughs> so it was just a part of city life. So he recognized that he had to go beyond nonviolence. That he had to go beyond just giving a speech that he had to go beyond marches. So we started the Poor People's Campaign. The Poor People's Campaign shifted from equality and integration for blacks to an interracial coalition of blacks, Jews, Native Americans, Mexicans, Puerto Ricans, other Hispanic groups that aimed at alleviating, alleviating poverty for all, regardless of your race. With this shift, King was moving from the Civil Rights Act, Civil Rights, which are rights guaranteed under a constitution of a country, to human rights, rights given to all persons, simply because you were born. He was digging deeper. This was the same shift Malcolm X actually made 
three years earlier prior to his death. This is the same shift that W.E.B. Du Bois came to decades before both Malcolm and Martin Luther King. King was moving from cosmetic victories from the passage of certain laws to genuine equality by addressing social and economic issues such as full employment, low income housing, and a guaranteed income for all persons, whether or not you're able to work. King said that? Oh, shit, I didn't know that. I'm pretty sure somebody said, I, 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 should I be taking notes? <laughs> but now, to conservatives, King was now looked at as a radical. But to those in the black power movement, King wasn't radical enough because he still held on, held on to his nonviolence philosophy. In the last days, King didn't have many friends that he started out with and certain allies. They dropped them. Even blacks running political campaigns that came about because of the work that King had put in in the 1950s, in the early 1960s, didn't want King to associate with him. Carl Stokes, the first elected black mayor in a major city, Cleveland at that time, didn't want to be associated with King. He didn't even, King came out and spoke for him. He said, King, I don't need you. And when King came out for his victory party, he didn't call King to invite him. King was the Jeremiah Wright of his day at this time in 1967. So, have we achieved King's dream? If you follow his life and reinvention in 1967, the answer is no. No, we haven't. We are still dealing with the evils of society. We are still dealing with racism, war, excessive materialism, and poverty. A recent report stated that the middle class is now made up of less than 50% of the population. The lower class is now the new middle class. Student loans are almost $2 trillion, and more than 30% of the new graduates can't afford to pay back their loans. Graduates forced to live check to check and stay with mom because of the outrageous cost that higher education has now placed on them to earn a living. Protests over police brutality and racial profiling demonstrations are happening all around the world, all around this country in particular. These demonstrate that the children and grandchildren of the civil rights movement are still being viewed as less than human beings. People always wonder, hey, why don't certain groups trust the police? But I can show you photos from today and match them up with 1960. Match them up with 19, it's really the exact same photo, except it's just, a different, it's just 40, 30 years later. And once again, children are the product of their upbringing, AKA their parents and their grandparents. So if, and civil rights, first of all, is living history. That's one thing you have to understand. Uh, people always talk about civil rights like it happened 200 years ago, but my parents were 20 years old when Martin Luther King got, got killed and they're both still alive. Now. Their generation is slowly fading away, but there's still a lot of people who can testify to what happened in the civil rights movement. So it's not ancient history, it's living history. And as living history, you follow the example of your parents. And if your parents were brutalized by the police, of course they're gonna tell you, hey, be careful, don't trust the police. Okay, grandma, okay, mom. <laughs> you just follow the example from which you, from which you came, from which you were spawned from. Unemployment rates for African Americans and jail disparities for blacks and Latinos demonstrate that the ghosts of the past 500 years have not yet been laid to rest. So on this King Day, there are two things that we must realize. Number one, the dream has not yet been realized. Some have taken it, flipped it, mutilated it, shaped it into their in image of what they want it to be. But when you study Dr. King and what he stood for, especially in his last days, you will know that he wanted more than just for people not to be judged by the color of their skin. King wanted everyone to have the ability to climb the social mobility ladder. King wanted all people to rise up against the injustices of war, greed, and racism, even if it's not the popular thing to do. The second thing you need to realize is that King would have never wanted an actual day. If you study him, he never wanted an actual day. He always gave credit 
to the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, to SNCC, the Student Nonviolent uh, Coordinating Committee. He never stood out alone. Ralph Abernathy, the second in charge, always spoke before King. And when he got up, he thanked King. I mean, he thanked Abernathy. He thanked Andrew Young. He thanked Jesse Jackson. It was never about King. He never wanted a day. He wanted a movement. And that's what he was striving for in his last days. Yes, King was a dreamer, but he was so much more. He was a true believer in the equality and rights of all men and, be, and women. He was, he, he was very strategic. He believed that he could save the soul of America, which is in the vision and mission statement of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. As a strategist, true believer, and one trying to save the soul of America, if he were alive today, I believe that he would reject the day and keep on fighting the good fight of reforming systems for the good of all Americans. On his memorial in Memphis, where he was killed, it reads, below, here cometh the dreamer, let us slay him and see what will become of his dreams. If we continue to focus on the day and one speech rather than the full scope of his life, then those who slayed Martin Luther King Jr. will continue to win. We must go beyond the dream. King was much more than the dream of 1963. Therefore, we need to honor King in his totality and not just in a silo of a moment. For his ability to reinvent himself and to strive for more was more than just a dream. Now, how can you apply this in your everyday life? Because I always believe in making it a little personal if I could. I believe that when your dream becomes a nightmare, Dr. King is the blueprint. When what your major, what you thought you wanted to be your major, turns out to be different from what you thought it was going to be, Dr. King is a great blueprint. When the path you were on, when you realized that you know, getting a degree in biology was a little tough, Dr. King is a great blueprint of how you go beyond your dreams. When your friends turn you away because you become indifferent, Dr. King is a great blueprint of what you should do. When I, and I followed the same blueprint when I went to Columbia. When I realized that things in my life were happening that were different, I made an exodus and said, I'm going to Colombia, I'm going to South America. People looked at me like I was crazy, but it was the best decision of my life. So number one, when you find that your dream has become a nightmare, you gotta do a self-evaluation to reaffirm your principles. <laughs> Go inside yourself to make sure that your co core beliefs still hold true. And if they don't, make sure that you understand why. You may not be able to go to Jamaica like King or go to Columbia, South America like Joshua, but in your self-evaluation, you can spend a weekend or two at home and just say, you know what, I'm not going to go out. I'm going to go within myself. Number two, when you feel like your dream has become a nightmare, you got to draw up a new plan. That's what Dr. King did. He said, I got to go beyond nine dollars. I got to go beyond marching. And he drew up a new plan. He didn't just dream. He planned. Because if you fail to plan, your plan to fail. He was a strategist. He didn't just dream. He was very, he was very strategic in what he did. A good example is my brother. My brother's a great singer. He's one who always dreamed of making it big one day. So one day, I went home and said, hey, where's Byron? He disappeared and ran off to Washington, D.C. to go sing for American Idol. And he actually made it through a few rounds of that preliminary stage. That first day, you actually meet a few judges, and they keep walking you through. Now, after a few rounds, he finally got to Paula and Simon. I think it was Paula and Simon and Randy. I never watched the show. But um, and they said, hey, can you sing another song? He didn't have another song. <laughs> he didn't make it to Hollywood. He didn't have another song because he was working off a dream. He didn't have a plan. You got to have a plan. And because he failed to plan, he failed. Number three, when your dream has become a nightmare, you got to cut off those things that hinder you and hold you back. Once King drew up his new plan and decided to execute it and spoke out against human rights violations in Vietnam, spoke out against, on property issues that were affecting not just black Americans, but all Americans. King lost some allies, but he didn't let that hinder you. He, did, he didn't let that hinder him. 
So what's holding you back? What's preventing you from moving forward? What friends are holding you down? What are your eyes and ears absorbing on a daily basis? Hopefully something positive, because the things that your eyes and ears absorb mold your mind, and they can either shackle you or liberate you. Move, number four, move but stand firm in principles. Once you reevaluate, draw up a new plan, and let go of the things that hinder you, you gotta move. Because if you, if you don't move, you die. But once you start moving, new challenges will arise and your foundation will be rocked. But regardless of what you go through, stand firm on what you believe. That's why the first thing is reevaluate yourself so you can stand firm on what you believe. Like the Silver Rights song, ain't gonna let nobody turn me around, turn me around. You gotta stand firm. Finally, don't stop dreaming. I know I said when the dream has become a nightmare, you got to go beyond the dream, but you still can never stop dreaming. Even though King's dream had turned into a nightmare, he never stopped dreaming. In fact, he actually redefined his dream, and it was no longer optimistic in his words, but a better fine, realistic dream of how he wanted to see the world. Listen to his speech called uh, Day of Christmas, Peace on Christmas, 1967, when he goes back and redefines his dream, and he calls out politicians, and he's more specific into what he wants his dream to be. Now, you also got to dream big. I had a friend once, and this friend, his whole goal in life was to get a car with rims. Car with rims. Now, in two years, he actually achieved that goal. I mean, yeah, you, you can put him on to your success story, the man who achieved all his goals. But he realized that life was much deeper than that. So, dream big. If you dream small, you got to start over. Dream big. Never stop dreaming because when you, when, you, when, you, when you stop dreaming, you lose hope. Never lose hope of a better day because when you lose hope, you die. So, in conclusion, the future of America still depends on the impact and influence of Dr. King. We still have some dark days ahead, but if we take King's redefined dream and plan and also do an eternal valuation of ourselves, of our dreams, of our goals, both collectively as a country, as a family, and individually, and we recognize that we have to work together to reach the promised land that King spoke about in his very last speech, the night before his death. Only together can we reach that land where we'll finally be able to say, free at last, Free at last, thank God Almighty, we're free at last. Thank you very much.